Hi, everybody. Welcome to Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate the movies. I'm your host, Jay White. Joining me today, uh, my good friend, my buddy, all the way from New York, John Marcus Arrest. Oh. Hey. Hey, man. Uh, you have such intensity right now. <laughs> I, I guess I try to, to bring a real energy to the podcast. This is not my medium. I began, my mom saw one Zoom show and she said, uh, she's like, it's a lot. It's a lot. Very loud. And I was like, well, that's the worst thing you could say to me. <laughs> I, uh, I had a Zoom show that I did that was like, basically just a, pri- it was like my family and a couple friends from back home. And I was testing out a non-Zoom video app that they were looking to do uh, shows on. And it was very weird because after the fact, my whole family, my friends were just like, yeah, this is great. My family was sitting down. They had like notes and critiques. My sister was very, very lovely gal, but she's also like, she's an engineering student. She studied, you know, she she approaches things from a very analytical brain. And she was like, you should do it like this, where you have this backdrop and where you have your microphone set up. And I was like, ah. Yeah, I'm gonna handle I don't, I don't mind those notes. I like it's more notes about jokes that bother. Like I wouldn't mind. My sister helped me. Say, I just moved like two months ago. I like someone to tell me what to do with all this shit. Like, uh, but family, it's always difficult. Like I, I run jokes by my sisters, uh, but if I run anything by my mom, if I ever make a mistake, she always goes, "It's not your best." And I'm like, "What the fuck? I have one best." I have one best, and if this was the new best, I wouldn't need to test it on you. I hate it. I can't run jokes by my family at all. I, if, if there's anybody who I could, it would probably be my dad, because my dad is the, the coolest about comedy out of everybody in my family. Yeah, yeah. Um, my sister is nice, but she's too analytical. Like She hit me up about an album thing after the album came out. She was like, you should put this there. And I was like, album's already out. It's already recorded. That's, like, that's the biggest thing. Whenever a friend asks me for notes... I've learned, I'm like, what kind of notes do you want? Do you want me to destroy this? Like, give you, like, a shitload of notes? Do you want, like, notes that you can fix in an hour? Like, tell me what level. But especially when it's done, I I did a thing where I asked someone, uh, I took a new batch of headshots. This this pretty much ruined our friendship. I had a new batch of headshots. You pay a fucking a thousand bucks at the end of the day for this shit. Yeah. And um, I said, hey, which of these four do you like? And she said, you look kind of tense in all of them. And I was like, I asked, which of the four do I get touched up? Not, do I look bad in all of them? These are the headshots. This is it. There's no cho- There's no going back. That's how I feel. I always feel bad when somebody gives me like jokes or a script that they want me to give notes on and they follow it up with, the deadline that this is due is tomorrow. And then I know I'm not going to be able to give them the best notes because I don't want to, like, if, if they give me a bad script or they give me jokes that, like, need a lot of work, I'm not going to be able to fully commit to giving them notes back. I'm just going to be like, this is great. Send it on. Which, I mean, that might reflect on my own spinelessness as a friend. But you must have to deal with it a lot. Like, I deal, I have a couple close friends that ask for feedback and notes. But I feel like all the writing gigs you've had, people must hit you up all the time. Oh, yeah. Are all you good all at- the time saying like you know how about like you know we have a relationship if i were to write you and i were to say the snl packet i was like hey i could really use a some feedback on this snl packet are we close enough that you do it yeah okay so i give you know. notes i give you notes on the snl packet i'd be hesitant to ask you only because i know you're you're busy you're a working guy you know i as far as giving notes my one of my favorite parts about the writing process is editing. So I love I giving love notes for that reason because I get to edit something that I don't have anything to do with. Sure. I think what what bothers me is when people sometimes ask for like you to add jokes 
in a way where I'm like, that's the job. That's what I want right. to get paid for. Like writing jokes is is not easy. You can't just go and then uh, in this scenario it ends. Uh, you know, joke here. When people put joke here, I'm like, you're in trouble. You can't just go back and just insert something that's actually funny. Right. It's just not how the process works. I get. Uh, yeah, but people sometimes will hit me up with things and they're like, if you think of any jokes, throw them in. And I usually don't think of any jokes and throw them in because it requires effort that exactly. is different. It's, it's like a different it. part of the brain. Yeah. Uh, have you, I really, one thing I'd like to do in my career, and I think it will happen, is just like punching up scripts. Have you done like full on punch up sessions? No, I would love to get into that though. Isn't I that do. Cool? It sounds like a great time. I've done a little bit of like sitting in on table reads and providing some uh, some like punch up notes for drafts after that. Um, but never like sat down and been like in a punch up room. That's what I want. And I don't want to be the guy at the computer making it work. I want to be the guy getting stoned and they're like, "This is funny." And then someone takes all the shit I say and they they perfect it. Yeah. You know, may, maybe one day we'll get there. We'll figure it out. <laughs> um by the way speaking of things for career stuff you got a, you got a milestone coming before we even get into it, we're, we're spending the first 10 minutes this is rare we never get we haven't even gotten to the movie you hate yet oh, we're just but it's okay because i don't think oh god it's a weird one to talk about but career stuff you do have a special coming out uh yes. congratulations amazon okay. amazon uh what's it's coming out what did you say october or something uh, october 26th it's called shelf life it's basically, I, I wasn't planning on releasing a special at, at this point in my career, but I wrote all this material once everything shut down from coronavirus in March, and um, I, I, I was fine-tuning these jokes, and I worked really hard on them, and they have a shelf life. So I was like, let's, let's, let's do something with these. Let's stop waiting for this, because we don't know what's happening. We right. don't know what our career is turning into. So I need to stop pretending I'm going to have a regular trajectory of late night show, album, Netflix 15. I'm just like, I wrote these jokes. I'm proud of them. Let's film an outdoor 30 minute special, bunch of jokes. Some of them will go bad, but it'll be kind of a time capsule of what this whole thing was. Yeah. I like that. That's a great idea. Cause I mean, I think at this point there's, nothing clearer than oh the traditional methods are all out the window now so yeah. doing something like that it's great uh i can't wait to see it check it out if you're listening um but let's uh, let's get into this 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 is a movie that i had never seen and you told me that you wanted to talk about it um i'd heard of it i watched it after you brought it up i don't really know what to expect here, it was I, I had a probably different viewing experience than you did. But you want to talk about what about Bob? <laughs> yeah, well, so I did. I did not see it when it came out. What did like eighty nine? It's like late ninety one. Eighty one. Early ninety one. Yeah. Ninety one. Yeah, yeah. So I I'm a big proponent of therapy, and I'm always talking about therapy and mental health. And there's no close friend of mine has not been asked by me once, like you should go to therapy. So there's a movie out. Therapy or psychology, everyone, oh, you're gonna love this movie. It's, it's like the same way, like, I think, like, uh, you know, when people have a gay friend and they meet the second one, they're like, you gotta meet my other gay friend. You're both gay. It's me and psychology. It's that same thing with movies. So I was uh, uh, a couple months into quarantine where people started to form bubbles. Um, uh, mm -hmm. My sketch team and I, we went to uh, one of our, one of my team members' wives father has a cabin or something in new hampshire and they were like you gotta watch this and i watched this piece of shit movie <laughs> and i was livid the whole time i hated it so much i not not necessarily the comedy of it but like the messaging of it what it was saying about therapy what it was saying about people like bill murray and i have to preface it by saying i've never gotten i get the bill murray thing it's never touched my heart in a way it has touched other people's heart. So you're the kind of guy who like, you understand Bill Murray, but you don't like, if he showed up at your wedding or something, you wouldn't be losing I wouldn't your be mind. Face at all. 
I wouldn't be I wouldn't be nervous. I I watched Ghostbusters as a kid, but I was with Harold uh, Ramis, right? Ramis? Yeah. That's that's my guy. Here you go. There's a comedy club here where they the host, no matter how many times I ask him to stop, says, you know, Ghostbusters, this next guy was in Ghostbusters. And then I have to go on stage and explain, in fact, I was not in Ghostbusters. I am not the guy who was 40 in the 80s. And um, that's my guy. Bill Murray, I get it. He's He's charming, but I wouldn't want him to organize dinner plans i wouldn't want him to cook me a meal it's a mess interesting okay i think i mean that that makes now i'm starting to understand a little bit more because i know I, I again i never watched this movie i i like bill murray i am not like i'm not as i i feel like the bill murray meme existed at a time when the internet was all about like bacon and cats and Bill Murray. Sure. And, and Wes Anderson. Let me say, let me let me add on top of this. I do, I don't get it. I it's fine. I like some of it, but at a certain point I'm like, I, I don't I, stop. It, it, it's like someone who it's like someone if they talk to you like this all the time and you were I was like, well what are they but who are they? <laughs> That's fine for a couple of minutes. An hour and a half well, Wes Anderson's clearly just a guy who loves dollhouses and loves to make his little creations and be very exact. I think there's a time and a place for it. I certainly had my my share of Wes Anderson movies that I love, but I also saw Grand Budapest Hotel and was like, why is this the one that gets all the, the love? Yeah. I, I, when I like the brand is Wes weird, weird is the brand, I'm out. So, yes. so the, the thing with What About Bob, so I watched it and it was a movie that I felt very easily able to tune out. I don't think it's, I didn't, I certainly didn't think it was bad. I, I don't think it's particularly like, it got 43 on Bravo's 100 Funniest Movies, according to the Wikipedia page. That's probably pretty generous. Uh because I'm just like, this is fine. Bill Murray is... I can think of 43 Holocaust documentaries that I found more entertaining <laughs> than what about Bob? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I guess I could chop up Shoah enough and watch that. Exactly. On an hour and a half long loop. A series. I feel like I sat down and really tried to pay attention to this movie. And I just couldn't. Because the premise of it is pretty insane. It's it's a premise that like doesn't really uh, is in even in comedy sense doesn't make a whole lot of logical. Yes, sense. yes. And here's the thing with Bill Murray, and I think this is this made my issue. It's that people find him charming, and there's so many plots that really lean on this idea that no matter how fucking nuts this guy behaves, he's so charming that that. Everyone's gonna fall in love, mm-hmm. and and there's and, and I think movies just rely on it, and that's the whole plot of this movie. They they portray him as crazy, right? And and I mean that in in like that's what it is. It's not a specific disease. It's a little OCD here that seems to go away. Yeah. It's a little death anxiety here that seems to go away. And otherwise, he's just crazy and clingy and invasive. And it's like someone took the DSMV and just and just put it in a bowl and mixed it all up. And they said, this guy's nuts. And they made guacamole out of out of crazy people. Yes. And they're like, hey, this is we're gonna throw everything. Oh, what's on this chip? Oh, a little bit of a little bit of narcissism. Oh, tasty. Ah. And and the whole movie is is him, he's the protagonist, and he's breaking societal rules that we would never accept any human being to break. And consider them anything less than a criminal or a villain. Uh, and because he's kind of charming and like not handsome, but I guess kind of like he's handsome, that 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 excuses criminal activity. With a guy like a haircut for Bill Murray's haircut, he's handsome enough. He gets the job done. I think he's gotten better in his older he he really could pull off looking pretty schlubby. Mm-hmm. Like he's been balding. Since the 80s. Oh, yeah. I think... Here's here's what I think about Bill Murray as far as... 
how he works in movies, at least in that stretch of his career, right? 80s, early 90s. Bill Murray's making his bread and butter on playing the straight man with crazy, like, he, he doesn't have the crazy energy the way he does in this movie. He's a straight man who's got wit and he's a little snarky and sarcastic, right? That's yeah. the way he is in Ghostbusters. That's the way he is in Groundhog Day. Um, a, a, a relatively normal everyman who happens to be funny and have all the best lines who winds up in an insane situation. And I think what doesn't is that Bill Murray is they're trying to have him do that again, even though he's being completely uh, nonsensical, unrealistic, and in a way that makes Richard Dreyfuss look like he should be the protagonist of the movie. Yes. Well, that's what my friends and I, when we saw it, we fought a great deal because I kept being on the side of of the therapist. Now, the therapist is upsetting to me, and I feel like the 80s might have been a different time in the way that people viewed therapy. Oh, yeah. I think therapy is obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a soft science. So it's like one of these things where there's lots of bad practitioners and there's lots of good practitioners. Mm-hmm. But I cannot think of one human being who would not be benefited by having someone that they talked about their lives and their place in the world. There's not, the world would be a much better place. So when I see therapy portrayed like this, just insane, manipulative art form that, that they're all just you know psychotic and money-grubbing, I don't like it because I think the narrative of therapy being nuts which was perpetrated by things like this. And I think like Woody Allen's entire film, oh, yeah. and even though Woody Allen has been going to therapy forever, like no one ever, people like Woody Allen who still go to therapy never say how it's beneficial. Right. They who always knows just... how many young kids Woody Allen would have touched had he not been in therapy way more than the one. So right. I'm saying like, he should say that. He should say, <laughs> hey, it really helped me out a great deal. I would have married... You know, three more adopted kids if I hadn't seen my therapist to talk it over. Right. Can you imagine all of the families within my own family that I would have ruined? You know who didn't go to therapy? Michael Jackson. You know who didn't go to therapy? Ted Bundy. All these people, if they had been in therapy, maybe, maybe a couple less kids. Maybe. Even if you're, here's the thing. I've been to therapy. Even if you lie in therapy, which I did to my therapist. Because I was, oh yeah. I I, uh, I went to therapy before I got sober, and I was definitely lying to my therapist about a couple things. Sure. Just to, because of my own bullshit that I later dealt with over the process of uh, recovery. But even lying in therapy, I still got something out yes. of it. Yes. As opposed to me having never gone. It's the same as like meditating, where like even if you discount maybe some of the studies where it's pseudoscience, like even just sitting and thinking about things without responding to the world is good for you. I, I will say this though, like for me, therapy is the, it's the one place I don't lie. Like I do everything I can to not even tell a white line therapy. If I'm late, normally in New York, we all blame the trains as a matter of course. I, if I'm late in therapy and it's because I was just like at home, I will say it. And I, I hold myself accountable because I want one space in my life where I'm not lying. Right. I think, I, I mean, I haven't been to therapy in a number of years. And I do increasingly feel the pull of my own, you know, psyche and soul. that are like, oh, maybe you should go back there. Why don't you go? Tell me. Uh, honestly, it's a, a money thing. I hadn't looked into, like trying to figure out if I could do a sliding scale anywhere. Or free yeah, I therapy. found a sliding scale. I got super, I mean, I was doing, when I first started in New York, I did like two sessions a week, 45 total. So like mm. it exists. I got to find that because I have garbage insurance and I think I need to find something that at least would be cost effective because I still go to like, I do 12 step stuff and I go to meetings and I have a group of, you know, a network of folks who I feel comfortable but the problem is, the only downside is that I do, I am honest with these people, but it's all piecemeal honesty, right? So, like, there's a group of people who I feel comfortable talking about a certain a subset of my life with. And then there's a certain group of people who I'm like, okay, yeah, you're not involved in comedy. I can talk about comedy stuff with you. 
or I can talk about relationship stuff with this specific group of guys or, and that kind of stuff. I feel like I need somewhere where it's all centralized. Yes. Yes. I, I think it's a great idea. I re- Here's the problem is I know too many people and it's more men than women where it's just like people are like waiting for something disastrous to happen in their lives. A parent dying, uh, uh, you know, they, they get mugged and they start having PTSD and it's like, no, you got to deal with this when things are yeah. fine. Yeah. Because you, you, need to to you need to have the foundation, the buffer, so that way when shit does hit the fan, you know how to deal with it correctly. And if I had something, a crisis happen suddenly, my therapist, we have a long relationship, she would make the time to, to talk to me. Um, and that's a good feeling to have. Because mm-hmm. some people have their parents to call. I, my parents are not the people I go to like smooth things out. So I highly recommend it. I think everyone should be in therapy. I'm a huge proponent. And it's movies like, what about fucking Bob? I give therapy a bad name and make people say shit like, oh, yeah, I just go to therapy to blame everything on my parents. It's like, yes, that's why I go. And it's amazing. Yeah. It's a great thing. Why is anyone complaining about blaming shit on their parents? That it's, is a very strange thing. It's, it's so it's cathartic. An American thing. It's an American, like, you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And then they murder their wife and kids. And you're like, maybe don't listen to that person for advice anymore. Yeah, maybe maybe they're not the most trustworthy about your emotional state. <laughs> here's, the great, here, here's the thing about this movie, too, is I also think, you know, even looking at stuff like the book cover of Richard Dreyfuss' character's book in this movie, it feels like it's a, a not just about therapy in, in general, which the movie definitely is, but there's also a very specific subset of therapists who become, you know, sort of celebrities in their own way. Yeah. Uh, you know, at the time, I would imagine it was from having a book that was out and... It all has the same font where it's like all caps, but the first letter of every word is a little bit bigger. And it's like men are from Mars, women are from Venus or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think that logically changed, evolved over time to people like Dr. Phil or uh, the other people who are not really doctors, but we trust with a whole bunch of information. Yeah. So it's, it's, I don't mind making fun of like uh, self help people. Like, who's that big motherfucker? He's like huge blonde hair. BuzzFeed did like a 10 piece article on him recently about people he sexually assaulted. And Tony Robbins. Dick. Tony Robbins, yes. Huge man. And like, I hate that shit. Believe you me, I get that shit out of here. But when you, that's why this guy, he's like a mix of the self help thing. And maybe this was big in the 80s. Maybe there were a lot of people taking advantage of the therapy boom. But, uh, you, I don't like people making fun of this like the, I mean again I'm, I'm joking you can make fun of whatever you want but I don't like when it seems like you're saying one on one all is all bullshit or that in this case the kind of symptoms Bill Murray is exhibiting in the beginning of this he would he would have killed himself as he jokes to like uh, get the therapist's vacation address in Martha's Vineyard yeah. he would these things don't just heal themselves because you're charming <laughs> If only they did, then no, no comic would ever need therapy. And all I know, well, like eighty percent of comics would ever need therapy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> my my friend kept rooting for Bill Murray, and I was like, he's not the good guy. Richard Dreyfuss, he's trying to have a family. That's he's, that's not the most illegitimate thing. You writing a book, it's going to get on the news. Yeah, and this guy just ruins his life. <laughs> this is this is the the other aspect of this movie that like. So I did some research, right? Because it seemed like it was one of these movies that, you know, it hit big. People talked about it at the time. It made a a good chunk of money at the box office. $39 million budget for this movie, which I guess is what happens when you add explosions to your comedy show. Um, Box office, $63.7 million. You know, I trust the people involved in this movie. I trust Bill Murray. I trust Frank Oz. I trust Richard Dreyfuss. Um, Somehow reading about the production of this movie, I had, I had some questions. I don't know how much you've read on some of the production. I know there was a a squabble between the two leads. Yeah, this is, so this is, I'm pulling this from the Wikipedia page. Uh, There are two separate interviews between Bill Murray and Richard Dreyfuss where they both confirm that they were actively 
uh, fighting during the production of the movie. So Bill Murray's like, everybody knows somebody like that Bob guy. You know, Richard Dreyfuss and I didn't get along in the movie. I drove him nuts, and he encouraged me to drive him nuts. I'm paraphrasing, but that's that's the gist. And Richard Dreyfuss, um, funny movie, terribly unpleasant experience. We didn't get along, me and Bill Murray. I got to give it to him. I don't like him, but he makes me laugh, even now. Uh, and no one ever comes up to you and ever says, I identify with the patient. They always come up to me and say, I have patients like that. I identify with your character. Because they're just yelling at each other. Richard Dreyfuss, uh, Bill Murray's coming up drunk to him, throwing ashtrays at him, saying everyone hates you to Richard Dreyfuss. It just, it's like, too, it's, it doesn't make sense. Even Daniel Day-Lewis wouldn't stoop to these levels, right? Like, even Jared Leto is not, like, Jared Leto is probably the closest equivalent to what Bill Murray is doing here. Yeah, it sounds like Bill not Murray right. was, just, was just drunk. Yeah, and that, that's the thing with these charming guys. It's like, yeah, it's maybe charming when they're at the bar, but if you're the person that has to be at home with them in the morning, it sucks. And it probably was good for the movie and blah, blah, blah. But I, I agree with Richard Dreyfuss that he, I think he should is the lead in my mind. And the movie, I was rooting for him. Mm-hmm. I think when he tried to kill Bill Murray, that was, that was a bit extreme. But what else are you going to do? What are you going to do? Exactly. He There's, ruined his TV interview. You and I can both relate. If we were to get a, a TV feature and someone just destroyed it, I murdered them. I'm especially not especially to the point where they remember the other person instead of us. All bets are off. I will. I will take you to a lake and blow you up. I'm not even. Gonna, I'm not even going to miss words about that. That's what's going to happen. And oh, oh, he's he's a little bit difficult with his kids to connect with. Welcome to the fucking world, buddy. You know, that doesn't mean you betray your father who paid for all your shit, your cabin in Martha's Vineyard. These kids clearly don't have any idea of, like, what it's like to really appreciate their parents. Because here's the thing. As we know, there's going to be plenty to blame your parents on later, right? So just take it while you can, kids. Enjoy having a private doc. On your vacation home. You're having a vacation home. That's the thing with his wife. I think it was very frustrated with the wife role because it was like, it wasn't clear what they liked about each other. Clearly, they've been married for quite some time. Mm-hmm. Their daughter is like 16 years old. So what's their dynamic? Because this wife basically leaves him in feeling, at least, for this psychopath, this old, if Bill Murray... If he wasn't famous, if someone who looked like Bill Murray showed up at your door and wouldn't leave your family alone, you would you would call the police. This is that's the exact setup to funny games, basically. This this is what happens when funny games is actually a comedy and not a horrifying torture movie. Is what about Bob? So I I just it's it's one of the few movies where like I just kept rooting for the it's antagonist essentially even though why is he the antagonist because he has some money because he's on the rise in his career this is not jeff bezos we're talking about here this is a guy he has a place in martha's vineyard he wrote a book so we're supposed to root for like this is like this is the joker essentially it's it's like the joker and we're rooting for the joker and i don't think that's good either i don't think it was good that that was the protagonist of that movie either can you imagine though if incels were a thing when What About Bob came out? They would definitely they would have latched on to Bob the same way they latched on to the Joker for sure. Of course. And the thing though with Bob is Bob he loves Richard Dreyfus's character. Richard Dreyfus's character. He like the reason he's stalking him is because he appreciates his advice. His advice works. So if you root for Bob, you should want what Bob wants, which is Richard Dreyfus to be happy. But Bob is fucking psychopath. So so Richard Dreyfus ending up in like a mental ward at the end. Clearly Bob has failed in what he wanted to do. So it's just a twisted you're you're rooting for chaos. And yeah, chaos can be funny on screen, but when you're in the middle of that fucking chaos, it's not so amusing. Right. Well, this is the thing. Chaos eventually just gives way to being white noise. And that's base. That's how I felt watching this movie. Like, there are parts that I laughed at. And, but there was a lot of it where I was just like, 
All right, Bill Murray just taught a kid how to dive. All right, Bill Murray's having a conversation with the 16-year-olds in a car. All right, Bill Murray ruined an interview. All right, Richard Dreyfuss is about to, to set off a bomb. It's just kind of like it all blends together. It's like, oh, yeah, this is this is the set piece that's about to happen. Huh, okay. And then I just move on. I go back to washing the dishes. Yeah, and why did Richard... It's, did you just, I, I think it's because you don't really have a feeling of who to root for. I, comedically, I don't know, the goldfish, there's certain comic things where, again, it's just like, he has a goldfish, that's wacky. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, okay. I hate that. I hate, it's so, ugh. Okay, so here's, and this is interesting, I, I'm reading the uh, the critical response to this, right? There's a very interesting thing that Gene Siskel said, which I think we both are in sort of agreement is what I'm about to tell you is wrong. So Gene Siskel said, uh, Murray gave a very funny and enjoyable performance in the film, but that Richard Dreyfuss uh, gave such an angry performance that it ruined the film. I could see that. I I would not call it angry. I would call it justified. I would say the plot justifies him not being... (laughs) How do you murder someone with a bomb and not exhibit anger? What kind of pleasant anger are you supposed to express there? Yeah, it is a weird comedy in that sense, though, where it's like, I mean, you said it was 1991. Mm -hmm. It's just it changes so quickly what comedy is. But it is a weird line where it's like he's not necessarily in on the comedy. I I think the pain that he suffers is really realistic. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't translate into comedy the way that it could. But I will say I would rather him be angry than be something else. Like, I think that anger is at least indicative of them trying to make comedy out of it. Like, going to the lengths to build a bomb to blow somebody up for for ruining your life while you're on vacation, there is something inherently funny to that. Like, the level of heightening that you get to, that's that's what comedy's all about. Comedy's about heightening insane situations, making them, especially this kind of a comedy. But there's just something about this movie that, like, it didn't quite work. And I think, I don't know, man. It's it's a weird one. I'm I'm sort of ambivalent towards it in a way that I wish I could have more of a set in stone feeling about why I couldn't jive with this movie. Remember in the in the opening scene when Bill Murray interviews him for the first, Bill Murray says that his wife left him because she liked who was the singer, Jimmy Buffett. Uh, Neil Neil Diamond? Diamond? Neil Neil Diamond. Diamond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like... Sorry, I live right on the street. Uh, It's... uh, So, what happened to that wife? If this guy is so charming and so lovable, what happened with that wife? I want to hear from her. I want her to come in and fuck up his life. I want... What's what's the name of Richard Travis's character? Uh, Leo. Dr. Leo Marvin. I want What About Leo? And it's Leo... Fucking up Bill Murray's life. I want to see that one where he takes him to court and he actually has to sit in a court and a lawyer goes, you're going to jail. You can't act like this in a courtroom. I want that movie. Leo's Revenge. They're both still alive. Let's do it. Yeah. I think that that's the movie that I would rather see. I'm with you there. I want to see a movie from Richard Dreyfuss' point of view and not Bill Murray's point of view. I want to see What About Leo? I think a lot of the movie is predicated on, like, here's a man... With money, De- fuck. I think it's understandable. I have a hatred with with people with money. I'm all for them as them as uh, whatever they as they come. But you give me a reason why this man in particular, why this man, as opposed to all the other houses on this vineyard, why did this man deserve this kind of chaos? And why are, isn't his wife culpable in this? She's been a part of this empire journey. This is like the Bill Burr monologue. Where they said, like, you know, you were part of this this road. You're not just sitting in the back. You had some pretty good meals, and I don't think you've got leftovers and brought it to the homeless guy outside. You don't deserve this innocence after being married to this man for 17 years. And- man. Okay. Here's how I'd like to uh, – I, I want to wrap this up, and, and not in a way – where I feel like we've already covered like what we would do to fix it. What I want to ask, what I am curious is, and, and I ask you this especially because you have such an affinity for therapy, and I can't think of any answers to this question. 
Is there a version of therapy on screen that you think is is accurate and that people should watch if they want an idea of like, not this jokey joke, oh, this is what therapy is actually, it's going to ruin your life if you go to therapy. What's something that might show the benefits to try and convince people? I think the closest thing that to me struck me as good therapy was the first season of Big Little Lies. Um, because it was like slow. Well, when therapy becomes in a lot of these things, because you need to serve a narrative function, is it becomes prescriptive. And most therapy is not, oh, you should do this. Mm-hmm. Oh, you should leave him. Oh, you should ask her out. A lot of it's just talking. So I think the, it, the problem is uh, readers have used it in a narrative function um, to facilitate the catalyst for a decision being made. And that's not what therapy typically is. It's long, it's drawn out. So you really need to use therapy to show minuscule change or a thought to arise. Um, in, in this case, the, the problem, like Equus, Equus is about like a therapist dealing with a kid who blinded six horses. But that's the whole play, is the gradual journey of him trying to get to the bottom of what this kid is thinking. So you can't have it as a passive narrative function and then have it serve this 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 life-changing thing. Bill Murray's character, he couldn't even leave his house in the morning, but then he becomes automatically addicted. What happened to the last therapist that he left? Why did he just right. leave him alone? Um, so I, I think the way therapy needs to be shown is you, you just can't, it's gotta be more gradual. It, 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 it's, it's like a, a romance. If you want Bill Murray to fall in love with this therapist, that's what it's gotta be. If you're going to become obsessed with your therapist, then it's as important as like a romance and move Joe me so crazy that he becomes hooked up in the sky for no reason at all. And if you're gonna show someone, if you show someone stalking someone, you better make me believe that they fell in love with that person. You can't just go, they're crazy, so they just are hooked on him. And that's the thing with like, you have to think of it like a like a like a romance or like a, a, a friendship that you're gonna rely the whole thing on. You can't just have some be crazy, and that's why they love their therapist. That's why they need their therapist. It's hard, though. It's hard. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard to pull off. kind of thing where whenever they show stand-up comedy in a, in a TV show or a movie, they go on stage, they're doing their act, and then they go, what am I doing? <laughs> and then they launch into a perfect five-minute chunk about, like, real shit. Mm-hmm. I... Tried that one one time. I went on stage. I I got punched in the face. That they randomly on the street, <laughs> and I, I had a, a set. I was really well. It was at the Friars Club, and then I said I had that moment where I was like, "So, uh, got punched in the face today. <laughs> Fucking crazy. Fucking oh crazy. god! And it killed the room because that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. I need to sit down and write." But I just, I said, I was like, fucking crazy. <laughs> Swacky. What a world, right? That's my go-to. When, when, you, when a bit is not done for me, I, my, my punchline is, what the fuck? <laughs> fucking, what the <laughs> fucking bullshit? Uh, I love that. I, man, I feel like it's going to be, I, I got to watch Big Little Lies now because I don't have a whole lot of, exposure to therapy on screen besides like this and goodwill hunting um, sopranos did you watch all sopranos never watched any sopranos i know a lot of people that's what they've been doing this quarantine I, a lot of friends they finally get around to those big shows sopranos did a decent job i think of therapy in the beginning and then then it then it then it went off the rails and he, he wanted to sleep with this therapist and she was like is he a psychopath and it just went nuts but first season of sopranos they took their time it was pretty amazing it's worth okay. watching i'll check that out i still got hbo so i gotta i'll take a look whenever 
I'm done. What am I watching right now? I'm finishing up Shit's Creek right now, so I can dive back into well, some I'm also I'm on season two of Shit's Creek. Oh, get into it now. I'm I'm very very into it. I I can't. I'm on season the last season right now. I just got to season six, episode two. It so. stays good. Yeah, it gets better. It improves. Good, good. Um. Well, John Marco, I oh boy, I am. <laughs> I'm not only glad we did this episode because we got to talk about this movie and why it's bullshit, but also now I feel even more like I need to get back into therapy. So thank you for that. Go for it, brother. Double win. Um, where can the listeners uh, find you on uh, on social media? Of course, go check out you know, the new special Shelf Life on Amazon. Yeah, I'll be posting about it on all my it's Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. It's at John Marco Cerezi. It's just my name. Find me on there. I'll, I'll post about it so many times. Wonderful. Uh, you can find me at Diet J on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, J Light Comedy for show dates, live and live streamed. And uh, if you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe to the Patreon where you get bonus episodes and access to the Blockbusting Film Club and fun watch alongs and chat alongs. Great times. Uh, John Marco, thanks again. Peace. This has been Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change.